on the Crest of Beauty's Home podcast this week. My guest is Murray Weiss of Matchstick Productions. And for those of you who don't know, Matchstick Productions has been making the best ski movies in the business for about 25 years now. And I think they've played a really big role in cementing Crested Butte's reputation as one of the centers of steep skiing in North America. And uh, so I really had a good time talking with Murray because um, his movies have definitely been a part of my life as I've been a skier here in Crested Butte for about the same amount of time. So anyway, I hope you enjoy this show. And as always, please follow my show so you don't miss a single episode you can do that by visiting com and subscribing there. And let's go ahead and get on with this interview. This week on the Crested Butte's Home podcast, my guest is Murray Weiss of Matchstick Productions. And uh, Murray, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from. Well, so I'm Murray. I'm 50 years old, and I've lived in Crested Butte for 25 years. I was born in Seattle, Washington, and migrated this direction after I graduated from college. What did you? Uh, what were you into in Seattle? I assume skiing or. Yeah, you know, Seattle has an interesting ski culture. It's like growing up there. Well, first of all, I grew up there in the 70s and the 80s, so it was a lot less populated than it is now. I read recently that they've doubled in population since then. It's just become extremely popular. Um, And so when I grew up there, it wasn't as busy. It was a little bit more of a rural lifestyle, very much more of a kind of a rural place, so to speak. Yeah, bit of a cow town that had Boeing and, you know, wasn't so overrun. But in the winters there, in general, if you didn't, you know, go skiing, you might not get outside. It's just a ton of wet weather and rainy. Yeah. And skiing's extremely popular there. I got involved with a program in elementary school where you would jump on a ski bus in the morning and they would take you up to a ski area for the day and then you would ride the bus back on every Saturday and I would do that all winter every winter for all the way through high school I did that oh nice yeah and I got pretty into it I loved it I had a fun time with it you know as soon as I got my driver's license we'd drive up probably one other time a week or my dad would take us or something like that and then after that I when I graduated high school I didn't really have a plan or an outline and direction in life and really what I wanted to do I I didn't do very good in high school um I ultimately it seemed like it was more fun to be a bad kid than to do good in math which is unfortunate because I wish I would have <laughs> tried harder and got better grades uh-huh. um and and worked harder in high school and graduated you know I think I graduated with like a, low C average, like a 2.3 or something, very low like that, you know, yeah. I just, I basically never went to school and, and didn't try. Um, so after that, I went to, a, a junior college in central Washington state called Wenatchee Valley college. And at the time they had a program there for ski instruction and coaching. And then they also had a resort management degree and you would go there and in the fall term, you would take regular academic classes and then those would be supplemented with some other like very much athletic classes like um, anatomy, like okay. anatomy, stuff like that. You'd be supplemented and then you do, you know, some dry land training and those things. And then the winters, you would actually every class was on mountain all the days. Oh, cool. So, yeah, starting in January, you would go on the mountain, you would meet in the morning, and you would ski five days a week. Well, seven days a week, ultimately. That's a pretty good college. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, was, it was awesome. And at the time, I developed a super good group of friends. Steve Winter went there. Um, I, he's my business partner now at Matchstick. And uh, I'd known him in high school, but I got to know him really well at that ski academy. I had a bunch of guys that I hung out with that I was, I'm was i still friends with today. And I just I kind of fell in love with the culture wrapped around the sport of skiing. Like, I thought it was really fun to, like, go to the mountain every day and get on there and, like, you know, spend 120 days a year in ski boots. And, uh-huh. you know, as a result of that, after 
the first year I got a lot better. And then after the second year of that, I got a lot better as well. And I actually became a, a pretty good skier and got really into it. And then after two years there, um, I got my grade level up because the, the classes were easy. I was skiing on the mountain every day, right? I, yeah. I basically got 4.0. And I did really well. And some of the harder academic classes I still didn't do well in. But in general, I did well. And then I transferred to the University of Oregon to pursue a degree in journalism because ultimately I wanted to write stories for Powder Magazine and follow store and follow skiing around the country and around the world and go the places that it would take me and uh-huh. kind of live this life of chasing the storms and reporting in the, in the media about it. And, yeah. you know, it was a different time then there was no internet, there was no digital cameras. There was no, there wasn't, there was ski racers. And then there was like, as far as professional free skiers, there was Scott Schmidt and Jen, and Glenn Blake. Yeah. So it's so like all kind of the whole free skiing thing was kind of new. And I was a, definitely not a racer, but I liked racing. I did actually race in college. And then, so yeah, then I went to University of Oregon, stayed, stayed skiing, coached uh-huh. racing and ski raced um, up at Willamette Pass out of Eugene, Oregon. Uh-huh. Had a super fun time with that. Met some great people there. Did that for three more years until I graduated, and then I uh, moved back up to Seattle and tried to find my way. I got a job at Microsoft. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that was that was when Microsoft was still a pretty small company, relatively. It was still really big then. But my job was I sat in a cubicle with a headset and I sold Microsoft Office. So uh-huh. people would call up and they had two choices. They could order a three quarter or no, three and a half or five and a quarter floppy disk for $130 of Microsoft Office. <laughs> and then I would place that order in a computer system and somewhere, somewhere they would box up those floppy disks and mail them to customers um, across the globe. So you weren't really doing journalism. <laughs> no, I wasn't. But it was, it was, it was a it was the money that kind of lured me in. Sure. You know, it was like a steady paycheck. I think I was getting like $500 a week. And I was, th- to me at the time, I was killing it. You well, know? at that time, yeah, that was, that yeah. was pretty good, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't super hard, but it was, it was, a, it was, you know, it was nice to be, to have a professional job and getting paid. And living in Seattle was super fun then too, because... Uh, that was the height of the grunge time. Uh-huh, and, yeah. And, like, Pearl Jam and Soundgarden and Alice in Chains and Nirvana and all those bands were blowing up, and that was all happening around me in Seattle. But but my passion still, while I was doing that job, was I still wanted to be a writer, and I wanted to sell stories, but I didn't really know how to write, even though I graduated journalism uh-huh. school. I mean, I didn't know how to get a job. So I, you know, was interviewing all the time and always trying to get something else. I finally got laid off from that Microsoft job and kind of shifted into a position of ski instruction in at Crystal Mountain, Washington for a winter. Okay, yeah. And then I applied to be an intern at Powder Magazine, and I got that, and I moved to Southern California. I was an intern for Powder Magazine for that whole next fall uh-huh. as an intern at Powder. And that was a great experience. I got to meet some really cool people and learn a ton about writing. My job as an intern there was the writers would send stories in on typed manuscripts, and it was my job to then take those typed manuscripts and input them digitally into the computer by, like, typing them in. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> okay. So every everything that was submitted, I would start with the first draft by making it, putting it onto a Mac Classic. I would just, just type it in. And that actually made me a pretty strong writer because I was forced to write a lot and read a lot of these other people's sure, writing. Sure, get their yeah, and see the, and or... see the first draft, and then work with the editors there to kind of um, explore uh, <clears throat> their you know their craft and, and kind of learn learn from them. At the same time, uh, they did give me the opportunity to write some stories uh-huh. and, and and do some different things, and that was pretty exciting. And, they were actually really pretty cool to me. They uh, they respected the fact that I was really into skiing and 
you know, had a passion for the sport and writing. Well, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think that at the time, you know, they were kind of going through a, a, a phase where they'd come out of having several different editors that maybe didn't ski as much. They okay. were like journalists first and skiers second. Yeah, okay. And like at the time, the guy who was like the head editor was kind of making that shift and, you know, yeah. he was, it was kind of, it was kind of transforming. It was kind of a big deal. So they were really cool to me then, and that went on for six, eight months, something like that. And then I pitched them on the opportunity to cover, I want to say it's the second, but it might be the third, U.S. free skiing extreme. I may have called U.S. extreme skiing. Yeah, I don't think it's free skiing yet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it was the U.S. extreme skiing championships. And it was in Crested Butte, and I knew I had a free place to stay because my business partner, Steve Winter, was here trying to get a ski movie made okay. so I could stay with him. Gina Croft, who was running the ski area, was going to hook me up with a lift ticket, so I didn't really need any money from them. I just said, hey, let me come cover this event. Give yep. me the credentials. They'll give me free lift tickets. And so I came out here to that event and met... Um, I met up with Steve and a bunch of other locals in CB, Mark Peterson, and um, at that time met Seth Morrison and Dean Cummings and Kent Kreitler and Dave Swanwick. And was that the year that, that Kreitler won then? Is that yeah, like, that, okay, is the year, okay. that is the year that Kreitler won and Seth Morrison got second. And they repelled off the top into the Hall of Fame. Yeah, yep. Okay, oh. so I'm bringing this up because that's one of the reasons, honestly, that I live in Crested Butte. Cause, yeah. Because as you know, that was on ESPN back then, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I remember watching that and I'm like, they do all this cool stuff, like I'm going there. Um, it was crazy, but, right? Because at the time, there was no free skiing con. There was that free skiing competition. And, and, and Valdez, and that was it. Yeah, yeah. And it felt very much like, you know, mogul skiing was for sure popular. A yeah. lot more popular then. Yeah. And ski racing, still popular today, was sure. really popular then. But there wasn't this other element. And it very much, when I came here, I remember very much having the feeling of, this is a part of something cool and new and super fun and um, a great vibe and represents a whole side of skiing that a lot of people are doing that isn't represented in current competition. Yeah. You yeah. know, which was exciting and fun at the time. And and I think, you know, ultimately there's a lot of free skiing competitions now and it's a thing and it's a scene. Yeah. And without Crested Butte doing that for those first five years, whenever they did it, when they were mm-hmm. the only ones doing it, I don't know if it would exist. Yeah, it's hard to say. The way, the say. way that it does now. They set the stage and really built that. And and it was cool to come here. So basically I came here, met all those people, stayed in Crested Butte, started working on a ski movie with my business partner. Um, and then have been here 25 years there you go ever since so that's kind go. of my 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 back story to it yeah so. yeah no and, and we can just to keep going with there and it yeah you know crested butte in that in that time period like this was like the epicenter right because mm-hmm. of the the extremes because you know you open up a powder magazine and it's like windy or allison or swanee or seth or you know this is like where everybody was this is this is the spot. And then you guys are doing your movies and yeah. bring this whole new thing too. I mean, yeah. it's such a cool time and, and that's when I moved here and that's that's why. I mean, it was all right. that all together was just like, that's this is, this is the place. Yeah. Yeah, for so, sure. It had this like cool vibe of an alternative type of skiing. They also had free skiing. Or it just ended maybe. Like in the f- yeah, it was, it was still going then. I think yeah. just a little bit. But the town was a lot... The, the ski season was a lot busier than it is now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there, I think that's part of it, though, because I think yeah. it was really... I was thinking about this earlier today when I was yeah. thinking about our interview. And, yeah. and, you know, when you when the Mullers came here and they're like, no, we had the best groomers in Colorado. And it was mm. like, what are you guys thinking? Like, no, we have the best steeps in Colorado. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I think that's why we were popular then, because because... This was they like promoted this thing. That, that was like their thing. And I mean, we even got the X Games, which I bet no one even knows anymore, which is crazy right. to even think about. You yeah. know? But it was, that's what we were doing back then. That's right? just because I think the vibe that they put out was like Crested Butte was this fun, freewheeling space yeah. where it was a cool place to come and get rad. And um, yeah, it was, it was, 
it that 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 is what it was, and it was, and we had and it was there were some good snow years then too, yeah, yeah. like that helped, but uh, yeah, and it was just a different different town. Yeah, yeah. Well, fingers crossed that Vale will uh, realize that that's that's positioning that maybe they should go after. I, I think so. Being you know, my my experience from them is that. And the meetings that I've had with them is they understand the resort business and they're not blind. They can look at their mountain and see what it is and yeah. mark it to the best of their ability. And I, they're so excited to be a part of this place. Yeah, they're just like so keen. And I don't. I, I think they will. You know, go for it and make it and you know, try to bring it back to more skiers and which is you know a lot of people aren't going to like, but. It's just, well, you know, and that's funny too because we did get more skiers then, and then you look back and you're like, wait a second, East River was a double. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, like yeah. how how was it not horrible? But I don't even remember like. Yeah, the North Face was a single. Sure. Super slow. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, but um, yeah. Anyway, all right. Well, let's talk more about filming then. So, yeah. so Matchstick. Um, so you got involved with it mostly because you knew Steve, and he was already doing it then. Yeah, so he hired did, me actually. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so how did, you know, what were you, were you just instantly, like, filming? Did you have any film experience, or what, what was your role? No, I, you know, I actually was, didn't actually work as a photographer. Um, I, I did actually film a little bit on that first movie, but not much. Steve did most of the filming. I helped him. Back in those days, it was a lot harder to shoot cameras, mm-hmm. um, and it was, you know, they were expensive to load and shoot. You had to use film. You would shoot a shot and not know if it turned out or not. Yeah. You had to be really calculated and smart about everything. You had to, to pay attention. So, you know, the two of us would kind of work that camera and shoot wherever we could. There's a lot that really goes into making a movie other than filming, like co- talking to people, coordinating logistics, figuring out, you know, making plans, and then, you know, the editing st- components of the film and essentially that first year we spent a lot of our time learning how that all worked at that yeah Yeah. and and really like kind of diving into that um and uh and and do and and doing doing those kinds of things again the ski area was super supportive of us crested butte ski area Uh um gina croft at the time was the marketing director and she was just like open arms towards us you know, gave us lift tickets. If we brought a pro skier into town like Seth Morrison, she gave him left list left tickets. The the ski patrol let us, uh, you know, open runs for us mm-hmm. the whole nine. Um, really accommodating. We actually shot some really cool stuff at the ski area with uh, Seth back in those days and yeah. other, other pro skiers. Um, it's funny. You know, looking back, I remember... You know, very much priding ourselves on when we're making ski movies that we were like the good skiing, fast moving crew where we could like get in, set up a camera, not waste the skiers' time, and, yeah, yeah, and get a shot, and then and then get out of there and set up and do the next one, yeah. You know, whereas now it's almost the opposite. It's, we're slow. No, we're not slow because <laughs> we're not good athletes or good skiers, but because we want to craft the shot meticulously and like you're thinking more about the lighting and all these other yeah factors. exactly yeah it's like more of a component versus just you know speed isn't of course you want to try to move quickly but yeah you understand the process a lot more yeah yeah well i guess let, let's just kind of continue on that road so it's mm. early january right now so maybe go through a year in the life of matchstick a year in life currently what Matt currently does? let's do it currently yeah. let's just skip to now like, like how, how, your, how the business flow glows right. I guess the, the business flow in general goes for the last I've, I suppose this would be our 26th year of making ski movies and in general the way that it goes is we start in January and we start filming pro skiers doing their things at different places across the globe and we'll do that all from January until the end of April yeah, and then we'll take that footage, we'll put it together, and then we'll release a movie the second week of September. Yep. So we'll put that movie out on film tour ourselves. So what we'll do is we'll get a crew of guys together. They'll go around in a truck from city to city, and they'll set up shows in each town, and they'll show movies, and we'll go city after city, and we do that for six weeks. 
six to eight weeks in general. Mm -hmm. And then we put those same ski movies for sale on iTunes uh -huh. after that happens. And then when that happens after that, we go to our third distribution window, which we go to um, subscription TV based models where the mo movies end up showing on. Okay. So things like that. Now, day to day, what that all means is generally in Jan January, our team spends a lot of time communicating with people that pay for the movie, i.e. sponsors. Okay. So what we do is we go out and we get our films funded by ski brands or other brands that want their products associated with our films and they want the opportunity to get content and to um, promote their products on our film tour. Yeah. So we'll we'll work that way and you know we'll spend a tremendous amount of time doing that. We'll spend one day a week every week um, where the whole team meets and we go over the creative for the film and we talk about casting and we lean on the skiers for tons of ideas. We hope for that 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 we can just facilitate make facilitate and make their dreams come true based on what they want to do and we, we go in that direction and then we'll plan out different stages of the winter we'll start to plan out february march and april and we'll and we'll go from there so we that we have a bit of a plan we'll also like work on our camera equipment update everything we're constantly switching camera equipment and getting new stuff especially the last five years we'll buy and sell new equipment we'll figure out what we want to use for this film based on the moods and themes that we're going with and spending a lot of time doing all of that um, in January. As, as in, in, when February rolls around, in general, on the ski movie, where our crews are kind of on the road, they're doing their thing, they're shooting the skiing, they're living by the weather gods. That's what I was just going to say. So yeah. how, how much fly by the pants do you do if you're like, whoa, it's Snowmageddon in place X, we're going there tomorrow? Or do you yeah, or we, we planned out more than that? It's not planned out much more than that. Okay. Um, for bigger trips where you have to book ahead of time to get yep. availability, it is. It's, yeah, just it, set up. It is, but we, you know, in general, we'll like to try to f plan shoots around where there's, you know, 70 to 100 inches of snow on the ground. Yeah. You know, and that's a great place to start. And then we'll kind of go there. Uh -huh. um, and again, tons of it depends on what where the skiers want to go. Okay, so they, they get a big say in that, actually. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, since they're the ones doing the skiing, yeah. they get to pick out where they want to go. Yeah. Unless we're, like, working with a partner, like a, a tourism board or a sure. ski area. Sure. Which, you know, in the past, we haven't done much of. In general, we've tried to stay away from, like, selling a segment to Vail or, yeah. or to um, Squaw Valley or whatever um, because... We want the freedom to be able to base our judgments on whether or not we want to go there based on the conditions and whether or not the skiers want to do, want to do that. Yeah. Now we have worked with resort partners. Last year we worked with Snowbird, and that was that was awesome. And the year before we worked with Squaw, but we shot those segments first and made sure that they were super good before we went back to the resort. And we were like. Um, Okay, cool. Do you guys want to work with us on promoting this film when it comes out? We came to Snowbird, we killed it. You know, worked out super well. Gotcha. Um, we don't we don't go into it ahead of time, being like, "Hey, Snowbird, give us X amount of dollars. We'll film at your resort. You guys can be a sponsor." You know, that re ultimately that is a lot of what our competition does, and we probably should do more of it, um, but we just haven't wanted to have our hands tied creativity create creative wise to, sure. to, to, to do that um, you know things who, who knows who knows what the future holds there you go yeah there you go this is Frank Consella with the Crest Beat Real Estate Minute and I just wanted to mention how incredibly grateful and honored I am when my friends and past clients uh, send me referrals and because of that, I just wanted to mention if you're listening to this podcast and you happen to know somebody who's thinking about buying or selling real estate in Crested Butte or in Gunnison, I would certainly be honored if you could pass my name along to them as well. And you can do that by visiting com, and my contact info is there. And I would love to hear that someone um, heard about me from this podcast. So that's it. Let's get back to the show with Murray. Murray. 
you started talking about like the relationship with the athletes and mm-hmm. and I mean, yeah, it's hard to imagine Matchstick without Seth or Seth without Matchstick, for instance. Yeah. Like, how are you friends with all the skiers almost? Like, I mean, you know, who are some of your favorite guys to work with? Maybe talk about that that relationship with those guys and gals. Yeah, you know, you can't you can't go on a a mission like that where you're going out for three weeks to the ends of the earth to try to capture a cool ski and not end up being friends with the people. Yeah. For sure. And I am friends with almost everyone we've ever worked with, for sure. And some closer friends than others, but not a lot live around Crested Butte. And um, so I don't see in general, but I feel like most of the people that I work with, I'll be friends with in one level or another for life. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. So it's that's probably the best part of the whole job. You know, there has been... So I'm older now, right? I'm, like I said, I'm 50 years old and I've been doing it a long time. And now I'm watching the effects of being a pro skier on some of the guys that I started with, you know, which is which is interesting for sure. How, how so? What kind of effects? Well, like, for example, you know, I start just seeing what their careers happen. Like, you know, for example, I, we started filming Shane McConkie when Matchstick started. Yep. Like, he was at the very beginning. He went through the course of the career. We filmed him. He actually died on a Matchstick production shoot. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that was like, and now I have to, and now I'm still friends with his wife and daughter. So, like, I'm kind of seeing the, the life cycle of all that. Yeah. You know, Seth Morrison, I also started with um, filming with back in the day. And, you know, filmed and traveled the world with Seth for like 10 years, 15 years, went sure. everywhere. Um probably been on 45 helicopter skiing trips with him all over the globe um and he made tons of money and was a uh i don't know i don't know how much money he made actually i i'm assuming that he did pretty well financially probably well maybe millions of dollars if you add it all up but you know did really well and became this really popular skier and then i think personally maybe got burned out on the whole filming photo commitment because it was like really like I, I think ultimately when you take something that you're so good at and love so much and then turn it into a job it wrecks it for you yeah, and yeah. I think that very much happened for Seth you know I don't sure. know this I haven't spoken with him um, but that was my impression with working with him a lot where he'd just be like I just want to go ski it's like sure. well, yeah dude we all do but we're making a ski move. but we're, we're gonna <laughs> film you while you do it <laughs> right but, it, but it, yeah it, but it's just it's not skiing Right. And so now, as far as I know, I don't think Seth has any sponsors anymore. And I don't even know if so. That, does that mean he's not a pro skier anymore? And and I don't. And I think he's totally over it and just does his own thing. And he's completely out of the industry, as as far as I know. Um, and then you have other people that I've seen, like Mike Douglas, who we started filming in the, in the '90s, who's like, you know, all about it and is like super. Has just stayed with skiing and is still sure. a pro and is like skis for Solomon still and is is all about it and is like you know 43 or sure. 44 years old and is just totally into it so I've just seen like different people's career we, I worked with a guy for a long time named Aaron McGovern who was an am- amazing talent on, on on snow and super bright kid and ended up um, drinking a shitload of alcohol mm-hmm. and it just it it kind of ruined his personality and ruined his kind of his career because people didn't want to be around him anymore Mm -hmm. but it was like this very much like you know you go out and you risk your life all day you need a drink at the end of the night to calm down and like skiing and drinking really go hand in hand it's like sure it's like it's like a sport right so he caught the evils of that and then then i saw aaron go through his whole downfall and now aaron's you know sober now and he's got a great life and he's he's kicking ass and so like i've seen i got that's what i mean I've, i've got to see sure how different people have gone through the cycle of wanting to be a pro skier to transitioning to their life after their pro pro skier. Whereas when I just started with people, it was just like, sick, you're getting a paycheck to go ski. And what's next? I don't know. Maybe I don't care, but I'm getting paid to go ski right now and I'll figure it out later. Yeah. You know? And so now I've seen where, where that's gone. So you probably see the opposite end of that too, where, where you've got some, some younger guy, up and coming guy, who's like, yeah, I remember watching 
sixth sense when I was eight years old, and that's when I knew I wanted to be <laughs> yeah. a skier. Yeah. And now I'm filming with you guys. This has got it. This is crazy, right? I'm, yeah, Aaron Blanc. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Lo- go. Tries to beat local. Said he went to the art center every year. And, sure. Know, now he's in our movies. Sure. There you go. You know, he said he knew he wanted to be pro from the time he was eight years old. Yeah. You know, and uh, so yeah, I was seeing that one. Then a lot of the guys, you know, four of the guys that work here all grew up, you know, watching our movies. Yeah. And then that their dream was like, oh, I want to, you know, work on one of those movies. Uh-huh. And, you know, and so, we, you know, we have that component too. That's so awesome. I, I, so being in it so long, it's interesting when you get to see those cycles happen. Well, kind of switching subjects, because yeah. I think this is an interesting for Krusty Butte. So you guys mm-hmm. have all this high tech and all these cameras and, and everything else. Mm-hmm. How are you learning about this stuff here in Crested Butte? I mean, it's not like you're cruising down to the community college to figure out how to edit. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it used to be, it used to be, we would travel mm-hmm. um, to work on our projects, to do the editing and the post-production of so our projects. So you'd go to like Hollywood or, or, yeah, or someplace? Yeah, Seattle or, or, okay. Seattle or Denver or LA or okay. San Fran, wherever. Where we, because their studio. But then, as technology got bigger and bigger, and computers got more and more powerful, we started um, learning about it and working in that sense. And you know, to today, it's like if you want to make a movie, it's all on YouTube. You know, really, it, yeah, it really, you can just like totally even some weird like editing feature. You're just like boop boop and done. Yeah, completely. Wow, completely. Yeah, we'll like. You know, there's definitely time spent in everyone's day at this company, almost every day, where you're watching some kind of tutorial thing about a different product or work through or Kodak or camera code or filter or lens or computer or hard drive. I mean, almost every single day. Really? You know, because it's it's changing like lightning speed. And it's it's incredible, it's incredible. Huh. Our production costs have gone down. Ease of use has gone straight up. The ca- yeah. the cameras that we use, while expensive, are incredibly reliable, incredibly easy to use, and um, literally anyone c- could do it. Yeah, you, you know. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it's it nowadays. It is a a large part of everyone's day. Is 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 learning about tech stuff for sure. There you go. How, um, so one thing that I've, I've, I've certainly noticed is, and, well, I'm sure you guys have too, mm. but man, it's just, it's everywhere these days because everyone in their pocket these days has a pretty darn good camera and a pretty darn good video camera. Yeah. And they've got an outlet for it Yeah, with Instagram and Facebook and everything else. Yeah. And, and you can see some amazing athletes doing amazing stuff. Mm-hmm. What it, I mean, what do you think about that and how that affects what you guys do and, and, and where the future goes? Well, it's, it's ultimately, at the end of the day, it's served to amplify us in a big way because we're also able to use those same distribution channels to mm-hmm. reach our consumers on an easy way. You know, like, I can almost equate it to back in the day before there was an internet. We used to make a movie, put it on VHS, take out ads in Powder Magazine, and you'd call a 1-800 number, and we'd ship the movie to you, and that's how we made our money. Yeah. Now we can, like, literally sh- be live from a shoot and put it on Facebook and show someone what's a- what's happening in our world. So yeah. it's afforded more opportunities for us um, in, in the sense. It has created more competition for us in the ski movie space sure. because everyone wants to do it on their own. That actually has kind of just made the scene better and, and bigger and, and grower. And, and and what ends up happening inevitably to a, a lot of our competition is, you know, they're like, oh, I want to make a ski movie. It looks so great. And then they get into it and they go out and they film the skiing and they have a great time doing that. And it's mm-hmm. fun and it's challenging and it's a new way to approach the mountains. But then you got to edit it together. Yep. Which it takes a long time. Which isn't as fun. <laughs> And then the harder part is then you got to go sell the movie, yeah. And you and you got to show it to people, yeah. So a lot of these, a lot of people get into it. They go out and they film it. They edit something short together and they put it out on YouTube for free. And they do killer stuff. And I think that it does a lot for the scene in general. And it also does a lot for us because we're introduced to new people and new talent and 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 different things like that. So. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I assume that's kind of how you get your skiers anymore. A lot of it yeah. is, is that kind of stuff. And back in the 90s when you started, yeah, I mean, was it? It was the extreme comps and word of mouth, or how were you? Was, you know, it's it, it it was it was it was those comps, but you know, I, I, it's, it really hasn't changed that much. We don't get approached by people who want to be in ski movies. No, they're not sending you like here's here's my YouTube edit. Watch it and tell me tell me when to show up for your next shoot. <laughs> no, no, not really. <laughs> Note to the kids out there: yeah. send these guys your YouTube. <laughs> yeah, we get two or three a year. Really, like hardly any. Um, I think ultimately the way that people get in ski movies every time, and it's been kind of the same way for a long time, is they get referred by another pro skier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like someone who we've already filmed is like, "Hey, you know, you got to check out this guy." There you go. This guy's the man. He's an awesome personality. He's super good. You want to work with him? This last, this last film we made all in really came about as a result of a, a, a strong group of women skiers that I heard wanted to make their own movie that was, you know, female based. Uh And we thought that that was just an incredible idea and we wanted to be a part of that. So then we approached them and said, hey, can we produce this movie for you? How about the music? Same thing with that. How are you finding the music? Because you're probably not finding it on KBT as much as I love KBT. (laughs) We used to. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) We used to. You know, everyone has a, a job around here of trying to listen to and, and find music, and we'll just spend the whole year listening to and finding stuff that we like and putting it into, you know, a private playlist that we all share with each other, and then the editors kind of sit there and make the ultimate last decision of what song that, that they like. Um, we also lean on the skiers quite a bit. What they're into, too. What they're into, or no, we'll just be like, what 10 songs would you like to see to your nice. skiing you know and yeah they'll they'll kick those in and and we'll go and and we'll go in that direction and then we'll approach the art, artist try to get it licensed and gotcha and, and yeah. go to that um it's an incredible time for music there's so much being put out there and there's such easy access to all of it it's yeah it's awesome yeah and the, and the reason i'm asking is just i when i i mean i'm almost your age but when i look back you guys had a I mean, the first time I heard 311 and Sublime was in your right. your videos, you right. know, and and that's pretty cool. And it still can go through my head on just a really yeah. good day, I'm, yeah. you know, in the zone. And i am got Sublime in my head because 20 years ago I saw it in your movie. Right, yeah. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah, and you know what? Back in those days, we used to literally, it was reading in-industry music journals. Okay. And then listening to KBUT going to the record store here and just chatting with people and and, yeah. fi- and, and finding stuff. Um, I think Seth actually introduced... I want to say Seth introduced us to Sublime or, you know... And just, There's a bunch yeah, of them, though. I mean, yeah, even there random was tons. stuff. Like, yeah, there was tons. There's, I still have a Lucy's Fur Coat CD, which yeah. was awesome, by the way. Yeah. But anyway... Yeah, there's um, there's tons of stuff like that. And, and I think that it's kind of a weird thing because... We are always ending up gravitating towards stuff that is made pretty recently but has yet to be discovered popular. Because yeah. once it gets really popular, in general, we can't afford to put it in our movies. <laughs> right. So we somehow find the good music that hasn't hit yet and end up placing it in our movies. And then what happens is like a year later, it blows up and it's you know, a combination of it was probably always going to blow up. And, yeah. And there's been a ton of artists, to tell you the truth, too, that we've had in movies that are super good that I've thought were going to be, like, the next big thing that... That didn't. That, that didn't, which is... which That game's weird, but... But, yeah, there's been there's been a ton that way. And I, I think that's because if it's popular, in general, we don't really try to go after it. If it's popular at this moment... Their phones are ringing off the hook, and it's going to be too expensive. Yeah, if it was popular two years ago, it's possible. If it's if it hasn't gotten popular yet, <laughs> and those are fun, and that's like I, I feel like Three Eleven and Sublime is a couple examples. Yeah, exactly. Like that. I mean, they, yeah, they were kind of not there, and then they were. And... Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, so how how often do you still ski, Crusty Butte? Are you out there a bunch? Um. Yeah. More. Uh, uh, yeah. I am actually. Yeah. Now. Um. The last two years, I've I've been out as as much like. Well, the last two years, it hasn't been cold, but 
that's a different story. Um, but, yeah. but yeah, I do, I do get out there a lot. I have a ten year old daughter, so I try to ride with her a bunch. Um, the previous probably twenty years before that, or twenty three years before that, I really traveled the globe and kind of went mm-hmm. everywhere and didn't ski Crested Butte all that much. I remember, you know, times in the in the late nineties and the two thousands where I would, you know, get back into town and I would just go ski because I'd been gone for so long uh-huh. working on ski movies that I just I just wanted to shred and and, and I and I and I couldn't and I and I and I wasn't able to. But now I'm pretty much I, I work uh, I work in general Monday through Friday, travel about one week per month. Life's gotten a little more normal. A little more normal, uh-huh. yeah. And uh, so I'll ski on weekends and um, before work. If it and if it's really good, um, you know, nine to twelve thirty or something. Uh huh. Yeah. You know, so as as much as I can when it's good, for sure. And how has that changed? Like the way that you ski, I'm, I'm assuming it would. Like before, you were just skiing for yourself, and then you were skiing like probably with an artistic eye everywhere, and now you're skiing with with your daughter. It's got to be three yeah. totally different ways of looking around while at what you're doing. Yeah, it it is, and you know you get so into it, you get so into it. It's crazy. Two years ago, it snowed a whole bunch, and I went up for a powder day with my daughter and her friend, mm-hmm. and they were nine at the time. And just watching them enjoy that and giggling and riding through the trees and, um, you know, yeah, they were going down blue runs or whatever. They're not that good. Mm -hmm. But just seeing how much fun that they were having and experiencing the whole that way was hugely eye-opening for me. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's why. Yeah. Yeah. It's the exact opposite of heli, heli skiing into a range in Alaska with four pro skiers where the stress level's on 10 and they're in one helicopter, I'm operating a camera out of another one and, you know, they're getting ready to ski the gnarliest line of their life and do we know about avalanches and, yeah. you know, is safety on stand and the, and the whole nine versus a powder day with my daughter. And it's just like, <laughs> and so like, the, like even seeing that, it was like, it's, it's, it was really cool and yeah. eye-opening. Does that help you like re... I mean, I'm assuming you still have a love for this after 25 years. Do you want to do this for another yeah, 25, I, whatever I, years? I do. There, there's parts of it that I probably... A good part about this job is that it's different. It's not the same thing every single day. It's, like, completely different. Like, whether you're on a film shoot, working on a ski movie, or editing ski footage together, or doing a film shoot for a car company, which we do a ton of that business too we do a lot of commercials so it's just a change of pace all the time Uh and that's what i like about it is like it's interesting that way it's not like you just come in and edit every day and it's not like you just come out and film every day but it's when you start doing the same things over and over that it gets hard like for a while i was pretty burned out on going on location to work on ski movies okay because that became very stressful and hard because you would show up to a location you'd meet up with a crew of probably in general about eight people and they'd be great people and they're super fun to work with and that was all great but then you would try to capture what they call progressive skiing which is basically expert skiing in at the highest very level Uh so these skiers would want snow that was so specific you know, uh-huh. soft, but not too soft. Yeah. Soft, but not avalanche <laughs> You know, and really, ultimately, in the end of the day, that happens in certain mountain ranges three to five times a year, if you're sure. lucky. Sure, and you have to be there on that day. And you have to be there on that day. You can't, you can't be like, oh, it's going to be good on Thursday. I'm going to fly up on Thursday and, and, and get that. It just, it doesn't work that way. You already have to be there. Yeah. Because those days happen so quick and so fast and only and weather ultimately forecasts 48 hours out is reliable. Beyond that, they're they're they, they're not reliable. So, it gets very stressful time and time again managing these crews that you're waiting for the snow to be perfect and meanwhile you're watching the production budget tick down day after day yeah. after day. Shooting ski movies is is got to be one of the well I'm sure they all have their own problems. Surfing is probably not that easy. Yeah, Any action they, sports, they, really. Anything. Anything where you're doing big stunts that involve nature mm-hmm. has its own challenges. Yeah. So that, that, that part gets exhausting. 
Yeah. You know, the stress of the uncontrolled. But you're doing that less these days, it sounds like. I, 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 I am, yes. And when you were doing that, so like, I mean, did you ever get to ski much? Probably not really at all, did no, you? No, not, not generally not. No. Would that have made it any better if you're like, yeah, I'm going to take my heli run now? Well, we did that. Okay. We did that for <laughs> you sure. Got All right, yeah. you got some. <laughs> yeah, you, you, I, got, I got some, and I have a I have a pocket full of days that will go down as, like, you know, the most fun Best day ever, but there's ten of them. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I, I got to take a few trips and, and do those things. But, yeah, we, as far as you have to kind of do that when you're out there filming as well, because if you just film, 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 the pro skiers will get burned out, too, because it's yeah. not skiing. Like right, need, yeah, there's a lot of sitting around and not... Yeah, moving. they need to keep moving. I mean, it's hard to do because of all the other things going on. Yeah, so. exactly. So what are your thoughts about, um, you know, your place in in skiing? This is kind of a hard question to yes. ask, but but in terms of... The, I mean, you mentioned it right at the very start of the... And in fact, you had a movie called The Tribe, right? Like yeah. The skiing tribe and the skiing, you know, what we all... What, those of us who really love it do. Mm-hmm. What do you think about your place in that and how, you know, people wait, you know, that's like one of the things in fall, like you here in Crested Butte, you're going to yeah. go to Vinatok and you're going to go to the matchstick move. Right. Yeah. Like, have you, have you thought about that? Like, like, and where, like, what do you think about that? I, you know, I'm humbled and honored for sure. Mm-hmm. All the time. Like I never, I never th- thought it, saw it coming. Mm-hmm. You know, it's pretty cool to like have your head down at something year after year and then you know finish a project and celebrate it and and you know look at it H- having a place in it i mean that's you know pretty amazing and pretty awesome um but i haven't thought i guess i guess i guess i haven't thought that much about yeah. it yeah um i know that i love the people that i work with like true love like they're great people and yeah. it's what brings me to work every single day and i know that um it's really fun to develop projects and do work with these people. And um, I hope that everyone involved can be appreciative and honored for the time that they've put into it and the things that they've done from guys that, you know, were in a ski movie 20 years ago uh-huh. to guys that we filmed today. And and uh, hopefully they can look back and call it the time of their lives. And I, I know a lot of them have. So. Yeah. so that's pretty cool. And if I can keep providing that for people then I think that that's a, a great place place to be. And hopefully the eight-year-old kid 10 years from now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, cool. Well, so Crested Butte is home for you, and, yeah. and it might have been easier along the way to, to base that at Denver or Salt Lake or yeah. LA or a lot of Oh, so places. many people have told us that. So why why do you still, why have you always, you know, stayed here, and why do you still, still choose to live here um, today? I'm allergic to concrete. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think ultimately when my business partner moved here, when I moved here, our thought was we wanted to build the lives for ourselves in a rural lifestyle with, and I'm just going to say, progressive-minded people that are open to being educated and exploring, you know, the world and taking care of the planet and um, eating good food and having a nice life. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we found, you know, we found Crested Butte and it had all those things, plus a sense of community that takes great pride in making the town the best it can be. Sure. You know, and that doesn't exist in a lot of places. No. It exists in a few for sure. Crested Butte's not the only one, Mm -hmm. but it exists here. And I think that's what's kept us here. Um, despite the fact that, you know, we probably should have moved to Whistler 25 years ago. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Although that might have been hard with the Canadian thing. But... <laughs> yeah. Well, we've done so much work up there. It's like kind of sure. like between. And you know what? That's not to discount Lake Tahoe either where Scott Gaffney, our other partner, lives. Sure. He's done tons there and that's been a very good <clears throat> town to us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, where can people learn more about you? Where's the, what's the website? Have your ass? Skimovie.com okay. and mspfilms.com. And one last question, and yeah. uh, I forgot to hit you up with this one first, yeah. but who else should I interview? Someone who else here in should Valley. you interview in Crested Butte? You know who one of the most interesting people that I've met in town is? Um, she owns Calico uh, Queen Tattoo. Her okay. name is Candice. She's awesome. Um, yeah, she's been here for like three years, and she's. Uh, I think she could be a really good interview. Perfect. Yeah. All right. 
Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much. That concludes this episode of the Crusty Beat is Home podcast. Thanks so much for listening. And please leave me a review wherever you listen to podcasts if you enjoyed the show. And if you have any questions about real estate in Crusty Butte or Gunnison, please visit Crusty Butte Real Estate Agent dot com for all your real estate questions you can find my contact info my name is frank consella and i will see you again in a couple weeks with another episode thanks again